Hey, I'm Chris Stoy and I'm here with Ray Foreman. We're Warriors for Justice and we're here to talk to you today about mediation. So if your case is going to mediation, that means that you've probably gone through written discovery, depositions, and trial is on the horizon and we're giving it our best shot at getting this settled, right? That's right. Mediation is an opportunity for the client to take control and control his own destiny. Absolutely. The decisions you make here can mean that uh, your case goes to trial and maybe you get more money or that your case goes to trial and you get less money or that you get the case resolved and you move on with your life. Uh, I would like to add, I said that this means that it's happened after exchange of written discovery and depositions, but sometimes when your case warrants, the defense will reach out to us and ask for an early mediation. But <clears throat> for the most part, the same rules that we're going to discuss here today still apply. That's right. So first thing, uh, and we've kind of compiled a list of questions that we've commonly encountered. First thing I want to talk about is dress code. What do you suggest for your clients? Well, I want you to be presentable and clean. Um, I'm very much of the person, you don't buy my clothes so you don't get to tell me what to wear. I don't buy your clothes so I don't get to tell you what to wear. But let me just tell you, everything about the mediation is going to be, they're judging your credibility, what you're like, and your clothes say a lot about what you're like. And so I want you to be comfortable and clean and appropriate. I don't want anybody to be distracted by what you're wearing. Absolutely. In, in most circumstances, this will be the first time that the adjuster for the insurance company is laying their eyes on you. Often the adjuster asks the mediator, and we'll talk about this more in depth later, but often they ask if they can just simply come and meet you. And if you're sitting there in ragged uh, clothes and don't ha you're not groomed and you just don't appear well, they'll think, well, that's the way that person's going to look in front of a jury. And the value of your case just went down. That's right. I don't think how you dress will help you settle the case, but it can absolutely keep you from settling the I case. I like that. I think that's right. So <clears throat> often clients ask, too, do I have to say anything? I'll take that one. Okay. Um, in some cases, we do what's called an opening statement at the mediation. The mediation is going to happen at a neutral location, the mediator's office, and we're going to start out in one separate room and the defense is going to start out in another separate room and the mediator may convene us in a bigger office or switch us around and bring us all together in one office and we will do an opening statement where one me or another lawyer from the firm will kind of give your position on the case, especially if it's a mediation that occurs prior to any discovery. And then we will, and you'll have been prepared for this, we'll ask you to just kind of say how the wreck or the termination or whatever affected you. So it will be necessary for you to speak at that point. Now by all means, if you don't feel comfortable about that, we can discuss it and you don't absolutely have to. I mean, later at trial, you'd have to speak anyway. So I kind of feel good like practice. it's a good practice. Yeah. Can I, can I add one thing? Yes. Um, I won't waive opening joint because I care as much about what their opening is as I care about our opening. Yes. I want to hear what their perspective is. So you want opening statements every time? I want them more. I don't think it makes me settle the case but I think it really signals to me what their defense is. Yeah. Now, if you're a client and you're watching this video, do be aware that sometimes the mediator won't allow opening statements. Like right. if it's a two hour mediation, they're going to say, we don't have time for that. So if you're at a mediation with one of our lawyers and there's no opening statement, uh, don't take that as something's gone wrong. It just means that we weren't allowed to or for whatever reason. And it's kind of a case by case basis. Yeah. I would add that, once you give your opening statement, the defense is allowed to give their position as well. I've seen clients sit across from the defense lawyer and or the adjuster who's telling them how they're not that hurt and this, that, and the other, and they just get fuming mad. I think that, was, that happened when I was a long, younger lawyer and less prepared and didn't prepare my client. Uh, but know that they're going to say stuff that pisses you off. Now now that you know that, you shouldn't get pissed off, right? Right. Well, on preparation, I think it starts way before the mediation. I'd like to encourage you to go watch our segment on 
uh, knowing the medical, knowing your case, knowing your treaters, because nothing will be more persuasive than a well-prepared client and presentation of the lawyers. And whether you get to talk or not is not important. This is getting us prepared for ultimate trial unless we're able to settle this. And by the way, let me just say, this could be the end of your case if you settle. Yeah. You don't have to go to trial. You don't have to keep taking depositions or answer interrogatories, which you hate, and get calls from my secretary saying, we have to be in court next week, mm-hmm. you know, on three days' notice. Bottom line is, if you settle, this could be the end of your case. Yeah, and oftentimes the court imposes mediation. And I know Rafe's the type, he would prefer not to go to mediation. I think he dislikes it to an extent, right? Uh, yes, I don't right. mean to put words in your mouth, but. Um, I see it as sometimes as a necessary process and that is because I've found that sometimes the insurance company policies and procedures dictate that the adjuster does not get additional authority which may be necessary to settle your case unless they go to mediation. So even though it can be worthless the whole process because Rafe and I could simply exchange numbers if we were opposing lawyers. It is something that triggers additional authority. So just see it that way. See it as part of of work in the process to get your case resolved. Let me tell you what I've told myself, Chris, to justify mediation. Almost every war and conflict that you can think of was won based on the information that was received uh, through the scout. So I go to mediation to be on the scout because in the event we don't settle at mediation, I may have learned something. I was able to judge the demeanor of opposing counsel, maybe his client if the client's there. Yeah. And I can use that information to help us win the war because trial is a war. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. And the object of a war is to kill everybody on the other side and have one of yours still standing. That's a pretty bloody, horrific thing to do, but that's what a trial is. Mediation And I always say a good mediation may be one where you feel like you didn't get enough and they feel like they paid too much. Maybe that was a good result. Yeah, I've heard a lot of mediators say that if both sides walk away unhappy, then the mediator did did his job right. I've heard that too. So a mediator is typically someone who used to practice law more actively, and sometimes they still practice law actively, and they work to resolve a case. Now, they... Their, their client, per se, is the settlement, right? That's their goal. That's what they want to accomplish. So with that in mind, they're not on our side. They'll be going back and forth uh, carrying the offers, and they'll come into our room, and we'll discuss what the defense has offered. And I may say, you know, sir, uh, can you please give us a second? Because I don't necessarily want them to hear what you and I are going to talk about. Because again, remember, their goal is to get the case settled. So if I'm, you and I are discussing and we're saying, well, I guess I would take X, but meanwhile the mediator is only he- hearing Y from me and Y is a much higher number, I want the mediator to think that because his goal, and he knows that I'm doing this, but we don't want him to know our number, his goal is to get it resolved. And meanwhile the defense is doing the same thing. They're telling him we're not going to pay more than you know, this amount of money, and he knows they've got more authority. So we're all kind of posturing to an extent. But the bottom line is, is the mediator's not our friend. So we don't say certain things to him. You know, we don't give him our bottom dollar per se. And that's not every case. There are times where I say, look, this is what it's going to take, and that's it. And I mean it. And maybe they we don't get it done, but at least they know that. Yeah, and I, I want to add to what Chris is saying about he's not our friend. That doesn't mean he doesn't like us or is not sure. or, or she is not friendly with us. What it means is she's not on our team. We got a team, they got a team, she's the referee. She's not on the team. And so you need to understand, and I get this question a lot, Chris, uh, when's the mediator going to decide what this is worth? <laughs> the mediator is never going to decide yeah. that. Yeah. This is not a judgment. This is a referee that is going to re- referee a negotiation. This is not somebody's going to say this is what this is worth, but there are exceptions to that. Yeah, the mediator's proposal, is that what you're talking about? Mm-hmm. So sometimes cases end in mediator's proposals, and that's we've spent 
however long the mediation is and we're at a point where the, it just doesn't seem like it's going to get resolved that day the mediator will issue a proposal saying that he suggests that the case settle for X amount of dollars. He will send that to my office and he will send it to the defense. And we will give a, a deadline to respond, say seven days. If we agree to it, we sign it, I sign it and I send it back to the mediator. If the defense agrees to it, they sign it and send it back. Now, if both sides sign, then it's settled for that amount it's all done. If we sign and the defense doesn't, they don't know that we agreed to that and vice versa. If they sign and we don't, we don't know whether they agreed. And that's important because later on additional facts could be discovered through the lawsuit or maybe the defendant goes to jail or maybe something happens with your case that lowers or increases the value. We can go back to that number we were at during mediation that high number because that we didn't agree to in the mediator's proposal and the defense can do the same thing is that making sense that makes perfect sense um what my clients have asked a lot chris who's going to be there so <clears throat> at a typical car wreck truck wreck those type of mediations even some employment ones you're going to have the for the defense you're going to have the adjuster for the uh, at fault parties insurance and the defense lawyer and on our side, you'll have the lawyer and the plaintiff, and then some people like to bring their husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or trusted confidant, mom, dad, and that's all fine. We need to know in advance so we can let the mediator know because often they provide a nice little lunch. But key is the defendant will not be there. And that pisses some of my clients off, and I get it, but it cuts both ways. Um, I've struggled with the idea and thinking, you know, I'm going to compel these defendants to attend mediation. but. Quite frankly, most of them don't have the authority to insist that the insurance company uh, settle the case. And sometimes you'll have an adjuster who's willing to settle the case, but you've compelled the defendant to be there, and the defendant is adamant that they don't settle the case. So we yeah, found you shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, you shoot yourself in the foot. So we've found that it's best not to. Uh, compel the defendant. Now, I do want the adjuster there, and if they don't have the adjuster there, I'm going to kick and scream and we're going to file a motion. Well, now, Chris, you're mostly talking about car wreck mediations, yeah. right? My experience in employment mediations, in case you're an employment client, is that the defendant is often there, uh, especially if it's court ordered, the court will order both parties to be there. Uh, if it's a malpractice case against a lawyer or a, a doctor, they're frequently there because yeah. they have malpractice policies that allow them to consent or reject the settlement offer. And so just depends on what kind of case you have as to whether the defendant will be there. We will know, though, and we'll talk to you about this in advance. That's part of our preparation. It starts well in advance of the mediation. If you have some concerns about the defendant being there, if it's a case where the defendant might be there, you got to tell us so we can deal with it. Absolutely. Um, something that I just thought of is there'll be times when the mediator may pull the attorney, uh, Ray Fry, out of the room to discuss something with us. Well, that happens all the time. Yeah, it's not that they're trying to hide something from you. Uh, and I'm even trying to think of an example, but sometimes they just feel compelled to discuss things with us, not in front of the client. You can ask me what we talked about. I'm going to tell you. It's just, it's a mediator thing, I swear. I can tell you what a lot of those are in my experience the mediator will come out here and say look I think I can get them to X number it, it, are y'all gonna walk out if it, but I think that's as far as they're gonna go well, he's testing the waters yeah yeah good point he's like is your client really that insistent on on right. on why I'm out and play it as it is and we're not gonna sell you out yeah. I don't we don't want you to think we're out there making some side deal if we have talked to you about our number we're not gonna lower it just because the mediator call us out in the hall we, we may not settle absolutely so let's talk about moves at mediation so there's a lot of tactics that we can use at mediation tell them what you mean by moves well so <laughs> When we start out, you know, we're going to start out at $11 billion and the defense is going to start out at zero and we're going to settle somewhere in the middle, right? And our first couple of moves are going to be pretty small usually and their first couple of moves are going to be pretty small. And by that, I mean, you know, we demand this and they say, well, we'll come up 3,000 and see then we're only going down 2,000. And it's a lot of psychological warfare kind of to 
um, it's almost like chess, right? It's it is posture. a lot. I was just thinking that. Yeah, so you're kind of trying to see where the other side stands. And with each move, typically, you provide counter arguments about like, well, but your client admitted in deposition that he had been drinking or, you know, just kind of making arguments to the mediator to try to bolster your case. Um, and those are moves. But there's also more thought out moves that sometimes happen in the mediation later on and that's brackets. Um, <clears throat> for example, if we're at 800,000 and they're at 100,000 and you know, we just can't seem to get any movement because we're making $5,000 moves, we'll say, all right, we'll go down to 600,000 if you'll come up to 300,000. That way we're both moving a significant amount to try to get the case settlement moving, the mediation going, because sometimes it just takes that, that kickoff thing. And, and it's like, okay, we've got them below the like scare us to death. You know, this is what the defense is thinking. We've got them below the scare us to death number. And we're thinking, well, we've got them at least to a point where starting to say, look a little more appealing. And those are brackets and those are used uh, during mediation. I was just going to say during this moving back and forth chess game, I experienced and I've been practicing 32 years and my clients think it's a game and it's not a game it may seem like a strategy game but it's not and we're not going to treat it as a game uh, we have to do the moves because if we could just walk in there and say we'll take half a million dollars and that's it well that's not a mediation and so certain insurance companies especially in car wreck cases have a script that they have to follow yes. that they have to have five offers and counter offers or else they're not even going to consider it a valid mediation and i know that sounds like a game it's not a game we're playing but we have to participate in the mediation we're not going to treat it as a game or make you feel like it's a game but we are going to be aware of what our opposing counsel is doing and respond appropriately absolutely um, that is so true i mean and i've I know some people that work on the insurance side that have come over to the plaintiff side that have told me that the adjuster was required to make five moves before they even came up to their, before they were allowed to extend their top dollar amount. So I, it's a necessary evil. Susan, that obviously of the firm, I, I remember I used to get so frustrated with mediation because I thought this is a waste of my time and, mm -hmm. and she agrees. To an extent, I mean, pretty much agrees with it, but just says, eh, it's the necessary evil. You know, we got to stay up high for a while until it's time to start coming down. That's um, true. It just, and again, it's not a game, it is a process that we must go through. We're not trying to roll the dice, we're not trying to odd man out. We're trying to get you the most value that we can get today on the day of the mediation in the most ethical, effective way we can do it. Yeah. So, Rave, does your client have to be at mediation? My client has to be in mediation. I'm a person that if you file this lawsuit, you sued these people, you created this situation, if I got to be there, you got to be there. That's yeah. just my rule. Now, are there exceptions to that rule? Sure. You're in the hospital, you're having surgery, you're, you know, whatever, you got a really good excuse. We might try to reschedule the mediation. If it's impossible, we'll try to get an exception. But my rule is if I got to be there, I want you to be there. Yeah. The mediator is going to require you to be there because you are the plaintiff and you're the only one that has authority to settle. Now, under extreme circumstances, I might could get you on the phone and get your authority, but the mediation really is not for the lawyers. It's for the litigants. And so if you're not there, you're not feeling the whole uh, effect of what's going on in the room. You don't know what the defense strategy is or what their case is about. Let me let me just tell you uh, an example hypothetically. If if you're saying that you got fired wrongfully and that you were retaliated against and then in the mediation they go, well, what about those 95 absences you had last year? Mm -hmm. Well, that changes the complexion of the, of the day, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need you to be there so that you can feel the full impact. So we're talking about once every five years someone doesn't come to mediation. So don't think that you're the exception to the rule. I don't you, think I've ever had a mediation without my client yeah, being there. Yeah, it doesn't happen 
it's just a point to be made. So you're, you'll be there. Uh, second, or next, I guess, is how long does the mediation take? And that depends. There are cases that I've mediated in two hours that we set for a two hour mediation. Often they are half day mediation. So they go from nine to noon or 8.30 to 12.30. And sometimes the mediator will go over if necessary. And then we have full day mediations. And some of those I've even gone from 8 a.m. until midnight to try to get the case resolved. Because again, that is our best chance of getting the case resolved. And sometimes in a really big catastrophic case, it's four or 5 p.m. before we're even sniffing the possibility of a settlement. And I patience, patience. Hey, I once asked a mediator one time that I really respect. I said, what did you see? What have you seen is the attributes of the lawyers and the cases that are the most successful at mediation? And he told me it's those who are the most patient. I believe it. I think that's a good example. Um, my answer to how long it takes, it takes as long as it takes. I've had mediations last an hour. I've had them last all, let me just say that I've had them last five days and that was worth it <coughs> for that media. Now we didn't sit in a room for five days. We left after the first day about midnight and we were on call and mediated that case for five days. So it takes as long as it takes. But what I want to say about the, the time factor is that um, what else is more important? Can you not spend all day today to resolve this case and not have to miss work again, not have to make exceptions for your daycare, not have to be worried we got to get out of here so I can pick my kid up at school? Come on. We can, we can invest the time that is needed to give us the yeah. best shot at mediating. Absolutely. And before we conclude, I want to talk about what happens if your case doesn't settle at mediation, because that's often the case. We've talked about the mediator's proposal, and that's a way that can resolve a case. But many times the mediator will continue to work the case. Just like we had to go to mediation for the insurance adjuster to get more authority to settle the case, sometimes we have to get closer to trial or let a fact or two more develop. Maybe they have to get some of your past medical records. Maybe they didn't properly evaluate the case when they came. That mediator will usually still continue to work on your case, still stay in contact with each side via telephone, text, whatever, and do his best to resolve the case. So don't think just because you're leaving a mediation and it's not resolved that the case is going to trial. I have clients that leave a mediation that's unsuccessful and say, I guess we're going to trial. But could be, could Might be. be. Uh, but don't think that's certain. It, it certainly is the case because there's still ample opportunity to settle a case. Some have uh, settled you know, on the courthouse steps. Some have settled after a week of trying the case. And I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for settlement at all times. I'm just saying sometimes it is the best option as opposed to a, a trial, but sometimes trial is the best option. You know, if we had a crystal ball and could tell you what was going to happen at trial, we'd be rich. Yeah. But the problem is, you can three things happen at trial. You get nothing. You get something. You get more than you thought. One of those three things is going to happen. You're going to get less than you believe it's worth. You're going to get more than it's, what you think it's worth. Or you're going to get nothing. And so two of those are bad. Yeah. Yeah. I had someone once tell me, and I, I just remember this rhyme because it always sticks with me, is settlements make the money flow, trials make the blood flow. I love trying cases. I, I do too. I know you love trying cases, but that's not always the best option for our clients. Um, that's right. Our commitment is to do what's in the best interest of the client, and sometimes it's to settle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, unless you have anything to add, I think that pretty much sums it up for mediation in a general sense, obviously. Yeah. I just want you to come with a good attitude to the mediation, and uh, it'll be a better experience for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm Chris Stoy. And I'm Ray Foreman. And we're part of Warriors for Justice. Thanks for tuning in, and you can check out more at warriorsforjustice.com.